Uh, our final panelist for this evening is a distinguished faculty member at the University of Southern California. She earned her clinical doctorate in occupational therapy at the University of Southern California. She completed her residency at USC's occupational therapy faculty practice uh, in August of 2015. As part of her doctoral work, she focused on improving and, and expanding the practices program for adults and adolescents on the autism spectrum. She plans to continue developing this program as a clinical faculty member at USC this year. Please welcome Dr. Tracy Jalaba. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I feel like going after all these amazing people. There's just been so many great things that people have talked about, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. Um, so, uh, as was said, I um, am a clinical faculty member at USC, so I work in our outpatient clinic where I do one-on-one -on -one occupational therapy with adults and adolescents, both associated with the university and from the community at large. So I work with students, employees, and then just anyone else that wants to come in um, and have some occupational therapy service. Uh, in addition to that work, I also work in our student disabilities office on campus as sort of the occupational therapist there to provide that perspective. For those of you who aren't familiar with OT, <coughs> occupational therapy is a healthcare profession that's really driven by looking at people's daily activities that they either want to be doing or need to be doing. Um, and figuring out how to get them to be able to do those things, no matter what injury, illness, condition, disability, lifestyle, environment, anything that might be standing in their way from achieving that. So that's where the occupation comes from. It's those daily activities that are meaningful to all of us. Um, so we really look at helping people perform, modify, or adapt any skills uh, that they might need to perform those, and then also looking at um, the environment and how we can modify that to help them have success. So at the OT faculty practice where I work, we do a specific type of occupational therapy and it's called lifestyle redesign. It was developed at USC and it's really looking at people's daily habits and routines and how that's impacting their health and their ability to have a high quality of life um, that they want. So it's a really collaborative process. We work, like I said, individually with clients and sort of looking at what are their specific goals and how can we help them achieve that. Um, so I did my doctoral residency. I just finished it up in August. And as part of that work, along with being mentored in occupational therapy and lifestyle redesign, I was focusing on developing our program that we have there for adults and adolescents on the autism spectrum. Um, what we found are notice at USC is that a lot of the occupational therapy services for individuals on the autism spectrum are more geared towards children or um, you know up through high school so some of you may have been familiar with OT in a school setting or maybe in a sensory gym um, but there's not a lot of services that are really geared towards adults and as you know we have testament up here the skills that we need as adults and the things that we're trying to achieve as adults are so different um, than when we're kids and we're trying to focus on you know going to school um, making friends or play so um, that's what our program is really focused on so some ways that we address that is really helping develop health promoting daily routines increasing social and community skills developing strategies to cope with stress and anxiety, self-advocacy, using sensory strategies in a way that might be more appropriate for adults than maybe some of the sensory strategies that we were taught as children, um, and then environmental modifications. And really the goals are um, to support our clients in achieving independent living, academic, and or career goals. So it could be all of those things if they're exploring that, or maybe for some individuals are focusing more on one direction or another. But we really want to use those lifestyle changes um, to help improve engagement in those meaningful activities or occupations, increase participation in the community, um, build skills, and just enhance overall quality of life. So that's sort of our main goal. So what I really want to do is just share with you today um, a couple sort of success stories or examples of 
different clients that I've worked with and sort of give you a sense of really what we might do um, or the type of people that we might help. So since this event theme is transition, I picked um, three different individuals that I've worked with that I think show different areas of transition that might be appropriate. And I'm going to use names, but they're all made up and ages are made up, so it's all confidential. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a transition into college. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jack. Jack was a 20-year-old student who was just starting out at USC. He lived with his parents near campus, so he had some independence. He was able to walk there by himself and get to class by himself and those types of things. Um, he was majoring in physics, and he was, had a really smart mind for math and physics, and that was really what he was passionate about. But in college, there's these things called general ed requirements that everyone has to take. And so even though he was really strong in those areas, and those were the areas that he was wanting to pursue, he had to get through a couple other classes. One of them was a writing class, and writing was not Jack's favorite thing. It was not really his forte, and it really made him pretty anxious to have to sit down and try to come up with a whole essay about some topic. Um, so our main goals in working together were to support him just in general in his transition to college, and then also helping him manage those GE requirements, particularly that writing class. So some of the things that we did together were we worked on strategies, coming up with strategies to help him manage his anxiety around the class. So things that he could do before class to feel calm, things that he could do during class that were maybe a little inconspicuous if he was starting to feel kind of nervous or anxious, and then also just ways to get ready when we had to sit down and write a paper. We also worked with strategies to help in general with the writing process. So we utilized some kinds of creative word games, we use magnetic poetry to help form sentences sometimes. And then we have this green notebook that he would take with his meetings with me, with his psychologist, and with his professor. And kind of any time he had some ideas or thoughts, he'd be able to write them down, and then we would have them all in one place so that we could utilize those. And then we also worked on some self-advocacy skills, so going to the student disabilities office and talking about accommodations that he might need, such as extended time to get papers in or extended time to doing class assignments. And some of the things that came out of that were what we really saw by the end of the semester, he had a great growth in his verbal uh, and written communication. He wrote some pretty great essays. And you know, we all, his professor, parents, and psychologists, we all just were impressed by his improvements, um, and he was on track to finish the writing class and move on to the next level. Um, so that was Jack. The next person I want to talk about is Barry in regards to transitioning into work or career. Um, so Barry was a 25-year-old graduate of USC music composition program. So he was already out of the program for about a year when we first met. He was living independently in an apartment near campus. He had gone to undergrad out of state um, where he had grown up, and that's where his parents were. And his main goals were to find more steady employment and then to also work on some, just developing some more healthy lifestyle behaviors. And his main thing was he really wanted to be able to stay in LA. Um, so he was having a little work here and there, but it wasn't really enough to support him. So, um, He's doing music composition, which, uh, you know, getting, he wanted to do it for movies or video games, and so kind of getting into that industry really requires a lot of networking and, you know, trying to meet people that way. Um, and that was something that was pretty really difficult for him. And then also just because of the nature of his work, um, his day was really not very structured. So he had some, developed some kind of unhealthy habits that he had identified just sleeping at weird hours, playing video games all night, and some really rigid food preferences. So um, things that we did were we talked about opportunities where you could meet people, uh, do some networking, we did some role playing about what kinds of things you would talk about when you were trying to meet someone, a potential employer. He was having a lot of anxiety around drafting emails to people, so we practiced that together. Um, and then we also talked about new foods that he could try. We figured out some of the places that he was buying food out because he realized he was spending a lot of money. So we tried to find more affordable options that still tasted good and were healthy. And then I was actually went to his apartment once and we cooked a meal together of something new and healthy. Um, 
students. So those are some of the things we did. And then sort of by the end of our work, he was having a pretty steady stream of freelance work that was coming his way, which was exciting. So he was able to be staying down in LA and paying his rent, all those important things. He had to develop some more healthy routines, which he was really excited about. And then he was just overall feeling a lot more optimistic about the future and about his ability to sort of tackle some challenges that might come his way. And so then the last person I'm going to talk about is just transitioning into more independence. So this is Stan. Um, Stan was a 45-year-old man. He lives with his mother. Um, and he had a history of having difficulty maintaining employment. So he had some jobs and lost them and was just kind of feeling frustrated about that process. And in addition to that going on, his physician had kind of told him that his weight was starting to become a bit of a problem and might be causing him some health problems down the road. So our main goals were to find him more meaningful and steady employment, um, to help access resources in the community that could support him in being a little more independent, and then also to adopt some more health-promoting behaviors. So I'm currently still working with Stan, and some of the things that we have talked about is he felt like he, a lot of his jobs that he lost were due to having conflicts with coworkers or misunderstandings. So we've worked a lot on assertive communication and we're able to utilize some of those to um, with conflicts that he was having with his family members. Um, we talked about some self-advocacy of things that you might want to or might not want to disclose during a job interview and you know what things were important to talk about. Managing finances has been a big one, so we worked on budgeting. Um, he has a lot of loans out, and we've been able to pay back those, and he's got a little bit of a savings right now, which he's really excited about. And then we've just started working on some healthy eating and exercise things as well to go to the other side of his health. So those are just some examples of some of the things that we might do. Um, with OT, it's all very individualized, everyone you know, has different goals, different challenges, different strengths, and so we really like to look at what are all those pieces and how can we get you to where you need to be. So I look forward to answering any questions later at the end.